policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. Today, the FOMC kept interest rates near zero, and in light of the progress the economy has made toward our goals, decided to begin reducing the pace of asset purchases. With these actions, monetary policy will continue to provide strong support to the economic recovery. Given the unprecedented nature of the disruptions related to the pandemic and the reopening of the economy, we remain attentive to risks and will ensure that our policy is well positioned to address the full range of plausible economic outcomes. I will say more about our monetary policy decisions after reviewing recent economic developments. Economic activity expanded at a 6.5% pace in the first half of the year, reflecting progress on vaccinations, the reopening of the economy, and strong policy support. In the third quarter, real GDP growth slowed notably from this rapid pace. The summer's surge in COVID cases from the Delta variant has held back the recovery in the sectors most adversely affected by the pandemic, including travel and leisure. Activity has also been restrained by supply constraints and bottlenecks, notably in the motor vehicle industry. As a result, both household spending and business investment flattened out last quarter. Nonetheless, aggregate demand has been very strong this year, buoyed by fiscal and monetary policy support and the healthy financial positions of households and businesses. With COVID case counts receding further and progress on vaccinations, economic growth should pick up this quarter, resulting in strong growth for the year as a whole. Conditions in the labor market have continued to improve and demand for workers remains very strong. As with overall economic activity, the pace of improvement slowed with the rise in COVID cases. In August and September, job gains averaged 280,000 per month, down from an average of about 1 million jobs per month in June and July. The slowdown has been concentrated in sectors most sensitive to the pandemic, including leisure and hospitality and education. The unemployment rate was 4.8% in September. This figure understates the shortfall in employment, particularly as participation in the labor market remains subdued. Some of the softness in participation likely reflects the aging of the population and retirements. But participation for prime-aged individuals also remains well below pre-pandemic levels, in part reflecting factors related to the pandemic, such as caregiving needs and ongoing concerns about the virus. As a result, employers are having difficulties filling job openings. These impediments to labor supply should diminish with further progress on containing the virus, supporting gains in employment and economic activity. The economic downturn has not fallen equally on all Americans, and those least able to shoulder the burden have been hardest hit. Despite progress, joblessness continues to fall disproportionately on African Americans and Hispanics. The supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic and the reopening of the economy have contributed to sizable price increases in some sectors. In particular, bottlenecks and supply chain dis disruptions are limiting how quickly production can respond to the rebound in demand in the near term. As a result, Overall inflation is running well above our 2% longer run goal. Supply constraints have been larger and longer lasting than anticipated. Nonetheless, it remains the case that the drivers of higher inflation have been predominantly connected to the dislocations caused by the pandemic, specifically the effects on supply and demand from the shutdown, the uneven reopening, and the ongoing effects of the virus itself. We understand the difficulties that high inflation poses and transport ease supply constraints. Like most forecasters, we continue to believe that our dynamic economy will adjust to the supply and demand imbalances, and that as it does, inflation will decline to levels much closer to our 2% longer run goal. Of course, it is very difficult to predict the persistence of supply constraints or their effects on inflation. Global supply chains are complex. They will return to normal function, but the timing of that is highly uncertain. We are committed to our longer run goal of 2% inflation and to having longer term inflation expectations well anchored at this goal. If we were to see signs that the path of inflation 
or longer-term inflation expectations was moving materially and persistently beyond levels consistent with our goal, we would use our tools to preserve price stability. We will be watching carefully to see whether the economy is evolving in line with expectations. <clears throat> the Fed's policy actions have been guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people, along with our responsibilities to promote the stability of the financial system. Our asset purchases have been a critical tool. They helped preserve financial stability early in the pandemic and since then have helped foster smooth market functioning and accommodative financial conditions to support the economy. Last September, sorry, December, the committee stated its intention to continue asset purchases at a pace of at least $120 billion per month until substantial, substantial further progress has been made toward our maximum employment and price stability goals. At today's meeting, the committee judged that the economy has met this test and decided to begin reducing the pace of its asset purchases. Beginning later this month, we will reduce the monthly pace of our net asset purchases by $10 billion for Treasury securities and $5 billion for agency mortgage-backed securities. We also announced another reduction of this size in the monthly purchase pace starting in mid-December, since that month's purchase schedule will be released by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York prior to our December FOMC meeting. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, we judge that similar reductions in the pace of net asset purchases will likely be appropriate each month, implying that increases in our securities holdings would cease by the middle of next year. That said, we are prepared to adjust the pace of purchases if warranted by changes in the economic outlook. And even after our balance sheet stops expanding, our holdings of security, securities will continue to support accommodative financial conditions. Our decision today to begin our tapering our asset purchases didn't, does not imply any direct signal regarding our interest rate policy. We continue to articulate a different and more stringent test for the economic conditions that would need to be met before raising the federal funds rate. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to complete the recovery and employment and achieve our price stability goal. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We'll go to Nick at the Wall Street Journal. Hi, Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Chair Powell, the markets anticipate you will raise rates once or twice next year. Are they wrong? Um, so, I would say it this way. Um, we try to focus on what we can control, and that is uh, how to communicate as clearly as possible in this highly uncertain world, how we're thinking about the economic outlook and the balance of risks, and how policy will uh, evolve uh, in that case and also in the cases which are frequent where the economy evolves in unexpected ways. So the focus at this meeting is on tapering asset purchases, not on raising rates. Uh, it is time to taper, we think, because the economy has achieved substantial further progress toward our goals measured from last December. We don't think it's time yet to raise interest rates. There is still ground to cover to reach uh, maximum employment, both in terms of employment and in terms of participation. Um, getting to your question, uh, our baseline expectation is that supply bottlenecks and shortages will persist well into next year and elevated inflation as well. And that as the pandemic sub subsides, supply chain bottlenecks will abate and job growth will move back up. And as that happens, inflation will decline from today's elevated levels. Of course, the timing of that is highly uncertain but certainly we should see inflation moving down by the second or third quarter. The time for lifting rates and beginning to remove accommodation will depend on the path of the economy. We think we can be patient. Uh, if, if a response is called for, we will, we, will not be, we will not hesitate. So what I will tell you is we'll be watching carefully to see whether the economy evolves in line with our expectations and policy will adapt appropriately. Um, and and that, that's what I would say. Well, based on, if I could follow up, based on your current outlook for the labor market, do you think it's possible or likely even that maximum employment could be achieved by the second half of next year? So if you look at the progress that we've made over the course of the last year, 
Uh, if that pace were to continue, then the, the answer would be yes. I do think that that is possible. Uh, of course, we measure maximum employment um, based on a wide range of figures, but uh, it, it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Gina at the New York Times. Hi, Chair Powell. Um, I was wondering if you could detail a little bit how you're thinking about wages at this moment. Obviously, we're seeing strong wage growth, particularly for people in sort of lower income fields. Um, I wonder if you see that as a positive thing or as a potential start to a wage price spiral and sort of how you, how you sort of delineate those two things. So wages have been moving up strongly, very strongly. And in particular, I would point to the uh, Employment Compensation Index uh, reading that we got last Friday. Now, in real terms, it, they've been they had been running a little bit below inflation, so real real wages were not really increasing. I think with the ECI reading, it becomes close to uh, 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 not, maybe not increasing, but cl close to back to back to zero in terms of the real increase. So, wages moving persist and materially above uh, to raise prices as a result, and you can wage price spiral. We not yet. Um, Productivity has been very high. Uh, the ECI reading is just one reading. Again, if you look back, uh, we, we so we'll be watching this carefully. But I would say that that at this point we don't see we don't see troubling increases in wages, and and uh, we don't expect those to emerge. But we'll be watching carefully. Next, what is Steve Leesman from CNBC? Hi. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if you could uh, perhaps uh, give us your thinking about the trade-offs between inflation and unemployment. You've talked about the shortfall in unemployment or employment relative before the pandemic, uh, and yet you have inflation, which is affecting everybody. Um, are we at or close to a point where the risk of uh, inflation is greater than the benefit that you'd uh, for recovering these lost jobs? So that now, from a risk management standpoint, it makes sense to move more aggressively on rate hikes. And kind of a related question, the, the statement today says you'll keep policy uh, accommodated until you hit that 2% inflation target. Our surveys show looking for 5% inflation this year, 3.5% next year. It sure seems like you're on track to modestly or moderately exceed that 2% target. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm not sure I totally got your first question, but, but I would say, in fact, could you just quickly succinctly say your first question again uh, sure the idea that that the trade-off between inflation and unemployment that you're uh, that you would keep policy accommodative to put this five million folks or find these five million jobs again at the same time all, all americans will be suffering from higher inflation is that trade-off worth it or is it better or smarter to raise rates right now to combat inflation uh, and perhaps not lean so heavily on the employment side of the mandate yeah, so you know this isn't this isn't the traditional Phillips curve situation where there's a direct trade off where that's really what we're talking about. The inflation that we're seeing is really not due to a tight labor market. It's due to um, uh, bottlenecks and it's due to shortages and it's due to very strong demand meeting those. So um, uh, I think it's not the classical situation where you have that that precise trade off. But I you know in, in this situation. Um, we, we do have a, pr a provision in our uh, in our uh, statement on longer run goals, as, as you know, that says when, when those two things are in tension, what we do is we take into account the employment shortfalls and inflation deviations and the potentially different time horizons over which employment and inflation are d d projected to return to levels judged consistent with the mandate. So it's a we used to call that the balanced approach paragraph. We have to think about the amount of the deviation. We have to think about the time it will take. And we have to make we have to make policy in a world where the two goals are in tension. It's it's very difficult. What it but what it really boils down to is something that's common sense, and that is risk management. We have to we have to be aware of the risks that were, that, that, particularly now the risk of significantly higher inflation. We see uh, shortages and uh, bottlenecks persisting into next year. We see well into next year. We see higher inflation persisting, and we have to be in position to address that risk should it become. Uh, should it become really a threat uh, to to uh, should it create a threat of more persistent longer term inflation, and that's what we think our policy is doing now. It's putting us in a position to be able to address the range of plausible outcomes. 
Thank you. Next, we'll go to Colby Smith at the Financial Times. Thank you. Um, Chair Powell, what are the economic conditions um, that would perhaps warrant a faster uh, pace of tapering? And I'm wondering how you would also characterize the risks that the Fed may actually need to accelerate that process eventually. Thank you. So I, I guess, as I said in my uh, opening remarks, assuming the economy uh, performs broadly as expected, uh, the committee judges that similar reductions in the pace of net asset purchases will likely be appro appropriate each month, and we're prepared to deviate from that path uh, if warranted by changes in the economic outlook. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you a lot more uh, detail on the, what that might be. Of course, if we do see something like that happening, if it becomes a question, then we'll communicate very transparently and openly about that. But it, I'm just going to leave it with the words that are in the statement. Sorry, was there a second part? Um, yeah, it's just on characterizing the risks that you, you might actually have to uh, to do so later on. You know, I, I would just leave you with, with the words we have here. Um, we, we are prepared to speed up or slow down the, the pace of reductions in asset purchases if it's warranted by uh, changes in the economic outlook. And again, if we, if we feel like something like that's happening, then we'll be, we'll be very transparent about it. We wouldn't want to surprise markets. We'll, we'll say in light of, of, of this factor or these factors, uh, we are considering doing this, and then we would either do it or not do it. But, so, uh, but I'm not going to you know, start making up examples of what, what that might be today. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Rachel Siegel at the Washington Post. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you so much for taking our questions. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that the Fed understands the difficulties that high inflation poses for individuals and families, especially those with limited means. What, what is your message to those families or consumers that are struggling with higher prices right now? And do you feel that your expectations around transitory uh, inflation is that message is reaching them? Thank you. Yeah, so um, first of all, we it, it is our job to, and we accept responsibility and accountability for inflation in the medium term. Our, it is, it, you know, we're, we're accountable to Congress and to the American people for maximum employment and price stability. The level of inflation we have right now is not at all consistent with price stability. By the way, we're also not at maximum employment, as I mentioned. So. I would want to assure people that that we will use our tools as appropriate to get inflation under control. We don't think it's a good time to raise interest rates, though, because we want to see the labor market heal further. And we have very good reason to think that that will happen as the as the Delta uh, variant uh, um, declines. So which it's doing now, you know, do as I mentioned, so transitory is um, is a word that uh, people have has have had different understandings of. For some, it carries a sense of, sh of uh, short-lived. And that's, that's, you know, there's a real time component measured in months, or let's say. Really, for us, what transitory has meant is that if something is transitory, it will not leave a, behind it permanently or, or very persistently higher inflation. So that's why we, you know, we took a step back from transitory. We said expected to be transitory, first of all, to show uh, uncertainty around that. We've always said that, by the way, in other contexts. We just hadn't done it in the statement. But also to acknowledge, really, that that um, that it means different things to different people. And then we, we added some language uh, to, to, to really explain more what we're talking about in paragraph two and paragraph th three. Um, we said that uh, supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic and the reopening of the economy have contributed to sizable price increases. Then we said progress on vaccinations and an easing of supply constraints are expected to support continued gains in economic activity and employment, as well as a reduction in inflation. So we're we're trying to explain what we mean, and and also acknowledging more uncertainty about transitory. So it, it it's um, I mean it's become a word that's attracted a lot of attention that maybe is distracting from our message, which we want to be as clear as possible. Ultimately, the the only th other thing I would say is look, we we understand completely that it's particularly people who, who are living paycheck to paycheck or seeing higher grocery costs, higher gasoline costs. When the winter comes, higher heating costs for their homes. We understand completely what they're going through. And, um, you know, we, we will use our tools over time to make sure that that doesn't become a permanent uh, feature of, of life. Really, that, that's, that's our, one of our principal jobs, along with achieving maximum employment. 
And that's our commitment. Thank you. We'll go to Chris Rugeber of the Associated Press. Great. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. Um, well, I wonder if you could update us. You talked about getting back to full employment. Um, and so could you update how you how you define that? I mean, you've you know, a few months ago, yourself and other Fed officials talked about getting back to the pre back to the pre COVID labor market. Uh, there was even hints you might try to do something better than that. Uh, now we hear talk of, as you mentioned, people retiring and there's talk of not being able to get back as all the jobs back because of that and other trends. Uh, you did mention the prime age uh, folks. So can you give us some examples of things you're looking at specifically to measure full employment? Will you be looking at prime age employment population ratio, for example? And if so, do you need to see that get back to pre-COVID levels? For, to, to achieve maximum employment, or is is there something short of that that would work? Thank you. So, thanks. So, maximum employment is um, it's a broad what we say broad based and inclusive goal that's not directly measurable and changes over time due to various factors. You can't specify a specific goal, so it's it's taking into account a, quite a broad range of things, and, and of course, uh, employment levels of employment participation. Uh, are, are part of that, but in addition, there are there are other measures of of what's going on in the labor market. Like wages is a key a key measure of how tight the labor market is, the level of uh, the level of quits, um, the amount of job openings, uh, the flows in and out of various states. So we, we look at at so many different things, and you make an overall judgment. Now, the temptation at the beginning of of the recovery was to look at the the data in February of 2020 and say, well, that's the goal because we didn't know any. That that's what we knew. That we knew that was achievable in a context of low inflation. I think we're in a you know we're we're learning that we have to be humble about what we know about this economy, which is still very uh, very uh, you know COVID affected. By the way, you know a lot of what we're seeing in the last ninety days is because of Delta. We were on a path to a very different place. Delta put us on a different path, and and we we see these things. But so I th I think we're going to have to ideally we would have. We would see further development of the labor market in a context where there isn't another another COVID spike, and then we would be able to see. I think a lot. We would see whether how does participation react in that world, in that sort of post-COVID world. Uh, right now, people are staying out of the labor market to do to, because of caretaking, because of fear of COVID, in significant to significant extent. You know, we we thought that the uh, that schools reopening and the and elapsing unemployment benefits would. Would produce some sort of a, a, of um, additional labor supply. That doesn't seem to have been the case, interestingly. So I, I think there's there's room for a whole lot of humility here, as we try to think about what maximum employment would be. We're going to have to see some time post COVID, so that we know, or post Delta anyway, to see what is possible. And I think the learning from for those of us who live through the last cycle is that over time, um, you can get to places that that didn't look possible. Now. Uh, what we also have now, though, is we have high inflation. So we have a completely different situation now where we have high inflation and we have to balance that with what's going on in, in the employment market. So it's a complicated situation, but and I would say we will we, we hope to achieve significantly greater clarity about where this economy is going and what it's, what the characteristics of the post pandemic economy are over the first half of next year. Thanks. We'll go to Howard Schneider at Reuters. Uh, thanks, and thanks for doing this. So, so given that answer about uh, employment, I, I would like to get back to Steve's question a little bit. J on a headline basis, just as it's evolved this year, do you feel that the two tests on inflation have been met? Sorry, so the, the two tests? The two tests in the in the state of the guidance that it has ah. to hit 2% and be on track to moderately be above it for 2%. Has the economy cleared that? That's a decision for the committee. I, I would I would put it to you this way: by the, when we reach maximum employment, when we reach a statement a state where labor market conditions are maximum are at maximum employment in the committee's judgment, it's very possible that that the inflation test will already be met. We're aware that that language sounds it sounds a little out of touch with what's going on, but uh, you know we're not at maximum employment when when the when that when that is the case. We'll look to see whether the inflation test is met, and there's a good chance that it will be if you look at, at how inflation has evolved in the last year and a half. 
so to follow up, you're, so you're not willing to commit that the current levels of inflation and their persistence have met moderately and for some time. So uh, given that, I mean, how we should render, how should we render what moderately and uh, so, moderately over and for some time mean? What, what I'm really saying is that question is not before us right now. We're, 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 you know, we were, we had the question on when to taper. We've now answered that question and the speed of it and all that. We're not, we have not focused on whether we meet the liftoff test because we don't meet the liftoff test now because we're not at maximum employment. What I'm saying is when, given where inflation is and where it's projected to be, let's say we do meet the maximum employment test. Then the committee's, the question for the committee at that time will be, has the inflation test be, been met? And you know, I, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of the committee on that. But the, the answer may very well be yes, it's been met. But we're not asking that question today because we're not, we're not running the liftoff test. We're not evaluating the liftoff test today. We didn't have that discussion at today's meeting. We did talk about the economy and the development of the economy, but we didn't ask ourselves whether the liftoff test is met because you know it's clearly not met on the maximum employment side. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Matthew Bosler at Bloomberg. Hi, Chair Powell. Matthew Bosler with Bloomberg. Um, so when you're looking at this question of assessing whether or not the U.S. economy is at uh, maximum employment, do you have a framework for making that judgment that is independent of what inflation is doing? And if not, um, does it kind of complicate that assessment uh, given all of the uncertainty about inflation right now? And the inclination to um, believe that, you know, the high inflation we're seeing is not related to um, capacity utilization in the labor market. Thank you. So we don't actually define maximum employment as we don't we define it in, in terms of inflation. But of course, there is a connection there. Maximum employment has to be a level that is consistent with with stable prices. But, uh, but that's not really how we think about it. We think about uh, inf maximum employment as looking at a broad range of things. You can't just look at, unlike inflation, where you can have a number. Uh, but with, with maximum employment, you could, you could be in a situation, hypothetically, where, uh, where the unemployment rate is low, but, but there are many people who are out of the labor force and will come back in. And so you wouldn't really be at maximum employment because there's this group that isn't counted as unemployed. Uh, so, so we look at a range of things, and I, you know, so by the thing is, by many uh, measures, we are at a very tight labor market. I, men I mentioned quits and uh, job openings and wages and things like. Many of them are signaling a tight labor market, but the issue is it, how how persistent is that? Because you have people who are held out of the labor market, you know, of their own. They're holding themselves out of the labor market because of caretaking needs or because of fear of COVID or for whatever reason, they're staying out. And it's, it's clear that there are, you know, with tremendous demand for workers and wages moving up. It does seem like we're set up to go back to a, a higher job creation. So that would suggest that you're not at maximum employment. So at the end of the day, it, it is a judgment thing. But of course, it, it, at the end of the day, it also has to be a level of employment that's consistent with, uh, with price stability. And if I could just follow up briefly, you know, you talked a little bit about this possibility that the two goals might be intention and um, how you would have to balance those two things. Could you talk a little bit about what the Fed's process uh, for balancing those two goals would be in the event that, say, come next year, you decide there's a serious risk of persistent inflationary pressures despite ongoing employment shortfalls? Yeah, I mean, again, it's a it's a risk management thing. It's not I, I can't reduce it to a to an equation, but also ultimately it's it's about risk management. So you you want to uh, be in a position to uh, to act it, to cover the the full range of plausible outcomes, not just the base case. And in this case, the risk is skewed. For now, it, it appears to be skewed toward higher inflation. So we need to be in a position to act in, in, case, it, in case it becomes necessary to do so, or appropriate to do so, and we think we will be. Um, so that's how we're thinking about it. And uh, um, I, I think, though, that judgmentally, too, it's appropriate to be patient. It's appropriate for us to, to see what the labor market and what the economy look like when they heal further. We, we know that we were on a path to a different place, as I mentioned when Delta arrived and Delta stopped, it stopped job creation. It stopped that transition away from 
a, a goods focused economy where there's excess demand for goods because their their services are not available, people are not traveling, that transition itself could help bring inflation down because presumably people would spend a little less on, on goods while they start spending on, more on travel and, and all sorts of travel services and things like that. So that we want to see that healthy process unfold as we as we decide what the true state of the economy is. And we think it will evolve in a way that will mean lower inflation, bottlenecks should be abating. We start to see that now with some of them, but but overall they haven't gotten better overall. And we're you know we're very aware of that. So that's that's really how we're how we're thinking about it. We're thinking that time will tell us more. In the meantime, we don't think it's time to raise rates now. It, you know, if we do conclude that that uh, that it's necessary to do so, then um, We'll be patient, but we, we, we won't hesitate. Thank you. Let's go to Edward Lawrence at Fox Business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for taking the call. Uh, so the Federal Reserve, I'm gonna talk about climate change. The Federal Reserve released a statement today, um, says the Federal Reserve supports the efforts to identify key issues and potential solutions for the climate-related challenges most relevant to central banks and supervisory outcomes. Is this putting us on the path to regulate what banks can offer loans on or invest in? like coal plants or fossil fuels? So that's that's not a decision for bank regulators or for any uh, agency. That's that's a decision for elected representatives. So what, we we feel that uh, any any role that we have, and we do think we have a role in climate change, it relates to our existing mandates. And, and our existing mandates are really uh, prudential regulation of financial institutions. We expect them and the public will expect us to expect them to understand and be in a position to manage their risks. So that's physical risk and it's transition risk for climate. And by the way, the large financial institutions are doing this already. And, and you know, we're, we're that's, we think that's right within our mandate. There's also a financial stability question, question the, the overall stability of the financial system uh, and so from that standpoint, we can do research, we can try to help understand what will the pathways be th through which climate change affects the economy, both physical risk and transition risk. But that's what we that's what we can do. And that's what we will do. And we'll, we'll do it well within within the frame of our existing mandates. We'll do it well. We're, we, we're not the people who will decide the national strategy on climate change. That has to be elected people. And, uh, and and not not so much us, but we, we, we feel like we have that that narrow mandate and we will we will do it well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Victoria Guida at Politico. Hi, Chair Powell. Um, so the Fed recently announced that there's going to be new conflict of interest rules for um, investments by Fed officials. And um, this follows, obviously, the, the resignation of two regional Fed presidents. And I'm just wondering, do you think that there's more that you will need to do to rebuild the credibility of the Fed, um, such as, you know, requiring officials to put their assets in blind trusts? And also, if you could speak to whether you have any concerns that um, any rules or laws were broken by Fed officials. Thank you. So we, you know, we, let me, let me just say that this system, the ethics system we had in place, we had been in place for decades and had, as far as we know, served us, served us well. And then that was no longer the case. And so we, we had no moment of denial about that. Uh, as a group, we stepped in and we took the actions that we took. Um, and, you know, within one FOMC cycle, we, we announced a new set of rules to, uh, you know, to try to uh, uh, put us back where we need to be, which is we need to have the complete trust of the American people that we're working in their interest all the time. Absolutely critical to our work, as it is for any government agency. And I feel like this this called that into question. So we we reacted. I th I, I would characterize it strongly and and forcefully. Um, if there were other things that we could do that that were reasonable, we would certainly do them. So you asked about blind trusts. Um, the you know the overall authority for ethics f around these issues in the federal government is the Office of Government Ethics (OGE), and they have a a long held position. Uh, which is not favorable to blind trusts. They do not encourage them. They, they don't think they're effective. They think they're cumbersome and and uh, and they think there are better ways to get at the things that need to be done. And, and those are the things that we're actually doing. So there, I don't know that there are any blind trusts for that reason, because they are the they're the regular. They say this on their website, if you look. 
Um, in terms of laws broken, uh, you know, that's I, I asked the inspector general to to look to see whether there were rules broken and whether there were laws broken. And I won't speculate on that. But that is that is that is with the inspector general now. And of course, out of my hands. Thank you. We'll go to Mike McKee at Bloomberg. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the critics of your patience policy argue that given the long and variable lags with which monetary policy works, that you are likely to end up, given inflation, by having to raise rates faster and farther than you would have liked and therefore send the economy into recession. Given the fact that basically your forecast has been chasing inflation over the last year and now you're talking about it not coming down till the second or third quarter, why would they be wrong in thinking that? Well, so let me say uh, what's happened, and we're very, very straightforward about it, is that inflation has come in higher than expected, and uh, bottlenecks have, have been more persistent and more prevalent. We see that just like everybody else does, and we see that they're now on track to persist well into next year. That was not expected, not expected by us, not expected by other macro forecasters. Now, let me say, you know, it's difficult enough to just forecast the economy in normal times. When you're talking about, you know, global supply chains in turmoil, it's a whole different thing. And you're talking about a, a pandemic that's holding people out of out of the labor force for reasons that we we can we can sample but we can't we don't have a lot of experience with this so it's very very difficult to forecast and and not easy to set policy so we have to set policy though so that's what we're doing and you know so to, to look at your question this way I, I don't think that we're behind the curve i actually believe that policy is well positioned to address the range of plausible outcomes and and that's what we need to do. I, I do think it would be premature to raise rates today. That that is that does that's not. I don't think that's controversial. Certainly, uh, I don't know anyone arguing for that today. But and the reason is that there's there's still ground to cover to get to maximum employment, and we don't want to stop that when when there's good reason to think. There's still good reason to think, although it's been delayed. Clearly, there's good reason to think that the economy will reopen, particularly if we do get past you know significant outbreaks of COVID, that's when we're really going to see what the, what the characteristics of the labor market are. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, the bottlenecks that we're seeing in global supply chains around goods and frankly now at our own domestic ports, because demand is stronger than the capacity of those ports, those things are going to work themselves out. We have a flexible economy. It'll take some time, but, you know, it took, it, it took uh, uh, you know, the experts managed to create a vaccine faster than, than certainly than I expected. And I think this stuff will work itself out over the course of next year. That is my my uh, baseline understanding, and that's very widely held among among people. But, you know, we are prepared for different eventualities, and we will use our tools to achieve price stability and maximum employment. And you know, we're going to let the data lead us to where we need to go. We, our policy will adapt and has already adapted. Uh, to the changing understanding of inflation and of bottlenecks and, and the whole supply side story, uh, which is also partly a demand story. So our policy will, will continue to adapt as is appropriate. Thank you. Let's go to Nancy Marshall Genzer at Marketplace. Hi, Paul. Hi, Chair Paul. Thanks for taking our questions. So you announced that the Fed is going to taper at a rate of starting at $15 billion a month. And that's more than twice the pace of the last taper. So why are you tapering faster this time? The, uh, the economy is in a, quite a different place than when we tapered back in, I guess it was 2013. Um, we were much farther away from maximum employment. Uh, inflation was much lower. This is an economy where demand is very, very strong, very strong and job openings substantially exceed the number of, of, un, of unemployed people. So the need for further stimulus is far less than it was uh, in 2013, where we still had quite a ways to go. I mean, after we began that taper, it was still many years before we reached uh, what I would characterize as conditions consistent with maximum employment. 
let alone price stability. So this is quite a different situation. And, you know, the committee unanimously uh, felt today that we had met the test that we'd articulated and then this was appropriate. And and um, this is faster than than, uh, you know, than what people had expected uh, six months ago. It's it's earlier and faster. And that's that's because our as I mentioned, our policy has been adapting to the situation as it evolves, as it's clarifying itself. And that's partly because we see inflation be coming in higher. Uh, so. Thank you. Let's go to Mike Derby. I, uh, yeah, thank you for taking my question. I wonder if the Fed has given any thoughts yet to the uh, end game for the balance sheet in terms of, you know, once you get the taper process complete, will you hold the balance sheet steady or will you allow it to start passively winding down? And then in a related question, uh, do you have any greater insight into what Fed bond buying actually does for the economy in terms of its economic impact? Have you been able to, you know, measure it or quantify it in any any fashion? Um, you know, because I'm sure, you know, there's often been questions about what is bond buying actually doing to help the economy? Sure. So in terms of the balance sheet, those questions that you mentioned, we, we haven't uh, gone back to them. Now that we've tapered, I expect that that's exactly what we'll do in coming meetings, and we'll do it in an orderly fashion. And we'll we'll, we'll talk about reinvestment and all those things, and, um, and we don't have to make decisions on those yet. But you know, typically when we're doing a new subject like that, we'll have a series of briefings and discussions, and that's what we will now begin to do. In terms of the effect of um, of asset purchases on the economy, so there's a a tremendous amount of research and scholarship on this and you know you can kind of uh, you can find different people coming out with different views but I, I would say the most mainstream view would be that you're at the effect of lower bound so how do you affect longer term rates there are two ways one you so you can't lower rates let's say let's say you can't lower rates any further hypothetically so you can you can give forward guidance you can say we're going to keep uh, the rate rates low for a period of time, either a specific period until certain conditions are met, the markets will do the math and that'll have an effect on longer term borrowings, even, even you know, 10, 30 years out kind of thing. So that's one thing. The other thing you can do is you just go buy those securities, buy longer term securities that will drive down longer term rates and hold them lower. And, you know, rates right across the right across the rate spectrum matter for borrowers. So lower rates encourage more borrowing, encourage more economic activity, people that you can service your debt, you have more free cash flow. You know, it's it's not different from what we do at the short end. Uh, so that that's that was discussed long before anybody did it. That was, I think Milton Friedman said that that was what you could do if you were pinned at the lower bound many, many years ago. So anyway, that's that's how it's supposed to work. And you know, the, the it's, it's quite hard to be precise about these things because you know, you only have one economy and you can't run two different economies right next to each other and do a scientific experiment. But most people find most of the findings are that, that, it, that it does support economic activity in the way that you would expect, which is to say at the margin, more economic activity with lower rates, which is why we do what we do more, more, more accommodative financial conditions lead to more economic activity over time with a lag. So I think that's, that's, uh, the main finding I would I would I would say on on QE. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Paul LaMonica at CNN. Uh, Chair Powell, Chair Powell, you've addressed already uh, questions about the uh, the stock purchases that took place from some of the regional Fed presidents, and uh, you know addressing the American people to make sure that they can trust the Fed. I was wondering also, in light of the fact that you know we now have questions about your own future, whether or not President Biden will nominate you for a second term, what would you say to the president and to senators that potentially you know, will be voting on a renomination about this specifically with regards to your future as, a, as Fed chair for a possible second term? So I'm not going to, I won't have any, I will answer your question, Paul, but I, I, I'm not going to have any comment whatsoever on, on the renomination process at all. I, I, I will say, though, that I have briefed uh, administration officials and I've briefed uh, people on Capitol Hill uh, in detail about what we did and why we did it and seeking their feedback, getting their reaction. But I, I you know, this is part of, part of my job is to, it, Congress has oversight over over the Fed, and we take that very seriously. So, if you're on if you're on our 
uh, one of the two committees that that has oversight over us, then I'm in regular contact with you probably. And you know, when something like this comes up, I'm on the phone. I'm offering to meet with you and explain it to you and answer your questions and, and identify any concerns people might have. That's just part of my job. So I, I do that. I, I don't talk about particular conversations, but you can assume I'll always do that. And I certainly did it in, in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Hannah Lang at the American Banker. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask about the supplementary leverage ratio. Is the Fed still planning on seeking comment on ways to permanently adjust that? And how concerned are you ultimately about banks' willingness to intermediate in the treasury markets without a permanent fix? So I don't have anything for you on, on supplemental leverage ratio right now. We are looking at, at ways to, um, if there are ways we can address liquidity issues through that channel. We're also, we also have a, um, there's a, 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 a working group at, headed by Treasury about over, over Treasury markets and what happened in, in, the, uh, in the acute phase of the pandemic and what structural things uh, may need to be done. So that would be part of that, uh, part of that work stream. And I, I, I know that there's a lot going on. I'm not sure when that report will be out. Um, but so it's, it's work underway. That's one of the many issues that, that are part of that, along with things like central clearing of treasuries, greater central clearing, and, and you know, many other ideas. It's, it's important that we have a liquid treasury market. It, it's, a, it's a huge public benefit that we do. And you know, I, I think we need to uh, do those things that, that enable that, while, you know, while also assuring safety and soundness of our largest financial institutions, who tend to be the main dealers. So we, we have to make sure that, that, that that's always a first order concern as well. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Brian Chung at Yahoo Finance. Hi, Chairman Powell, uh, Brian Chung, Yahoo Finance. So just to expand on the ethics conversation, uh, you talked about how you engage with people uh, on Capitol Hill and in the administration. You talked about what you've done already, but I'm just wondering if you could take a step back and just assess whether or not there was reputational damage as a result of that, either from the public's view or from the financial community's view of the Federal Reserve's independence. And then secondly, do you look back on the whole episode and have thoughts on your individual responsibility in preventing something like this uh, from having happened? So, I, you know, it's I think it's too soon to say what the reputational damage is. I think from the very beginning, uh, my reaction was we need to deal with this straightforwardly, transparently and forcefully. And that's what we're going to do. I mean, it's it, it, it means everything to me that we take do whatever it takes to to make sure that nothing like this happens again. And I, I like to think we've made a real good start on that. If you think about it, you, you, you cannot execute a trade unless it's pre cleared. And then you have to you have to say execute. It's not even a trade. Really, really, there's no trading going on. This is for investment uh, and you know getting liquidity for life's expenses. But you then have to wait 45 days uh, to actually execute that that sale or purchase. So I I, th I think it's a pretty good system. We're, we'll always be looking to uh, to make it better. Uh, so in terms of our independence, you know I I. I Look, I think we, we will address this, and I think we have, and I'd like to think it's enough, but it's going to, you know, we, we're, we're just beginning to implement it. We have to write the rules, which we're doing, you know, as quickly as possible. We need more people. We're going to have to resource this much more significantly here at the board. And also, we're going to need appropriate technology because, <clears throat> you know, we're gonna, we have the Fed has more than system has more than thirty thousand employees. Not all of them, far far fewer of them will be will be covered by this. But the senior officers uh, who are who will be covered by this will you know will have to have techn technology access and it's going to have to work efficiently. So there's a lot of work to do to to implement it. You know, I, again, I would just say <clears throat> um, this system has been in place for decades, and I, I it was in place when I took over. It was in place for the last, at least the last three or four chairs, and and you know, it it, it was what it was, uh, and you know, it proved to have weaknesses in it. And part of that was, that it wasn't uni uniformly enforced across the system. I'm a big believer in the value of the Federal Reserve System and the Reserve Banks, but you had 12 different ethics officers at 12 different banks, and you had ethics people here, and you know, compliance wasn't it wasn't all exactly the same. It was it was a little bit different and uneven, and and also the rules were you know we we didn't <clears throat> we didn't imagine 
the, the problems that happened. And they, they, they may have actually been, I don't know this, but they may actually have been in compliance with the specifics of our rules. They were clearly not in compliance with the part of our rules that said, <clears throat> don't do anything that, that, would, that would create an, a bad appearance. I mean, that's, that's clear this was a bad appearance. So um, anyway, what, what can we do? We, we, we are where we are. It happened. And we just have to deal with it forthrightly and transparency and own it and uh, step up to this, you know, meet this moment. That's, I'm, I'm totally committed. To, I'm not going to just I'm gonna take that as a yes or no. I'm just not going to start down that road. <clears throat> okay, thank you. We're going to go to Jeff Cox for the last question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. I just want to dig a little bit deeper on employment. Um, we, we've seen what's been called the uh, the, the great resignation um, with uh, folks leaving their jobs in record numbers. Um, is, is there any feeling there that maybe um, you've been accused of fighting the last war that perhaps the labor dynamics have changed um, in, in the post-COVID environment and that uh, full employment may not look like what it looked like before? Yeah, so <clears throat> what's happening is people are leaving their jobs. They're quitting their jobs in uh, all-time high numbers, but in many cases going back into employment and getting higher wages. So a lot of the higher wages you're seeing are for job switchers rather than incumbents. <clears throat> so that's just, that's a sign of a, of a really strong labor market as opposed to people just running off and quitting. There have also been, there, there are a significant number of retirements and we'll just have to see what that means. So toward, toward the end of the last cycle, which was the longest in, in our recorded economic history, we did see um, labor force participation moving up well above what, what economists estimate was the trend. Um, and part of that was people staying in the labor force in order and just not retiring at the rates they were expected to retire. So maybe this was just catch up on that. Um, I am a believer that over time, you, you won't know how far, you won't know what can happen with labor force participation in advance. And you're just gonna have to give it some time because we, we saw that over and over again. We're, there are things that we can, where we can say, you know, this is where, this is where the limit is. Labor force participation is a much more flexible uh, subject uh, for me. And so I, I do think we need to be humble about, about what the limits are of labor force participation. But we, we expect labor force participation to, participation to pick up. We don't know the pace at which it will do so. <clears throat> so in terms of full employment, um, as, as I discussed earlier, I think at the very beginning of the recovery, the natural thing to do was to look back at labor, condition, labor market conditions in February of 2010 at the end of the longest expansion in our history. It was so much to like about that labor market, a really historically good labor market, never perfect, but a good labor market. We're in a different world now. It's, this is a, um, uh, it's just very different. Um, the, the pandemic uh, recession was the deepest and the recovery has been the fastest. And wages didn't really go down, and you know, real incomes were more than fully replaced by fiscal policy. All of this is completely unusual. You know, the, an economy where inflation was driven by by services is now inflation where all the inflation is in goods, which have had negative inflation for a quarter century. So, you ask about full employment. <clears throat> I think we have to. I'm, I'm very open to the thought that that it's going to be uh, an empirical question of where it is located. And we're just going to learn more and more. I mean, one thing we'll learn, I think, I hope we'll learn in the next, in the near term, is once the Delta variant really does continue to decline, what's going to happen to employment? Are we going to start to see over the winter, you know, significant increases in jobs again? If you look back, the three, six, and nine month average job creation is between 550, 550,000 and 600,000. So, if you think of that as a, as a stronger, don't, you don't have to think back to the million job months of, of June and July. You can just think, okay, 550 to 600. If we, if we should get back on that path, then we would be making good progress. And, and we'd like to see that, of course. So we'll, we'll know so much more. And believe me, we understand it's a, it's a different world in so many ways. Um, and uh, we're, we're very open to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you all for joining us thank today. You. That is the end of the...